This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On October the 1st, our Defence and Security Studies Committee presented former CSIS officer and terrorism expert Phil Gursky. His theme, How Big is the Terrorism Threat to Canada and How Worried Should We Be? Mr. Gursky. Thanks, Dan, and, and thanks, Michael. And I want to thank the RCMI for having me here tonight. I really am honored to be in this institution. I think I was here at some point in the past, but uh, I think I've given thousands of presentations and they've all become a blur at some point. Speaking of which, uh, Dan did talk about falling asleep. Um, I've rarely had someone fall asleep in my terrorism lectures, but if you do, you ever seen Harry Potter? Mad-Eye Moody? Yeah, I'm gonna do one of those. So Brad, if you fall asleep, um, front row is not a good place to be, buddy. <laughs> but I really am, I'm, I'm, I'm really humbled uh, to be here tonight. And Eric has ma made me promise I'm not going to move, which is very, very difficult for me, because I tend to wander when I talk. Uh, I also don't use PowerPoint presentation for the very simple reason I'm technologically an idiot. And so I'm just going to talk. And uh, I did warn Eric I could do this for eight hours uh, nonstop. I will not do it eight hours nonstop because it's already 7 p.m. I'll get you out of here at a decent time. But uh, I do want to thank the Institute for, for having me here. Do you guys believe in, in serendipity or, or karma? So I, I came to the Institute. I took the train today from Ottawa, and I, I arrived here in the mid-afternoon, and I logged on to my laptop, and I, CBC, of course, is my homepage. Like every good Canadian, CBC is my homepage. And I noticed there was an article, the front article, about 4 p.m. this afternoon, talked about how national security, security issues, is nowhere to be seen in the election campaign so far. Not a single candidate has raised a single issue with respect to national security and public safety, which I find really, really interesting, which kind of ties into my talk tonight. But if you're interested, I, um, I do a regular weekly column for the Hill Times, Canada's boringest newspaper. It's, it's, a par it's a parliamentary newspaper. Sorry, I'm being facetious here. They pay me, so I, I should be nice to them. Uh, I have a piece coming out on Monday about why national security has not featured in the election campaign so far. I want to start uh, tonight with a bit of a story. Uh, and trust me, it is germane to what I want to talk about. We're here at the, the RCMI, a very storied institute in Canadian history. I personally do not have a link to the Canadian military, although when I began my career, when dinosaurs were just about extinct, uh, with the Communication Security Establishment, uh, Canada Signals Intelligence Agency in 1983, uh, we were part of DND, Department of National Defense, and I worked alongside a lot of members. In fact, at one point, I was the head of collection for CSE, and my best analysts were all military people, by far. They're the guys I relied on. But I want to tell a little bit of a story about what happened back in 2015. So my kids uh, like to milk their dad for free trips. And so when I was working for CSIS, I traveled the world to talk about terrorism with our partners in a, in a variety of countries. And in 2015, my eldest daughter convinced me, this is after I retired from the, the civil service, and therefore I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pauper, you know, pensioner, my daughter convinced me to take her to France. This was November of 2015, and we took a, uh, a two-week trip to northern France, we went to Normandy, we went to a lot of, we went to Juno Beach, we, went to, we of course went to Vimy, and we, we did a lot of that code of, you know, sort of the, the war, both, both wars, World War II, World War I. Very, very poignant, seeing some of the graves, some of the, um, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of graves, Canadians who died in the war. And our last day, we ended up in a very small bed and breakfast called Ocean Villas in, in Normandy. And Ocean Villas was run by an expat Brit. And it was a takeoff on the French, the town was called Ocean Villiers, but being a Brit, you couldn't say that. They called it Ocean Villas. And so we ended up at this B&B, &B, and they were all expat Brits, and we met a bunch of guys that did every, this is coming up to Remembrance Day, every Remembrance Day they would cross the channel, 
They would go to a small cemetery where there were no major fest, you know, sort of commemorations of the war, and they would honor the dead. Amazing kind of uh, habit these guys had. And at the same time, we ran into two Newfoundlanders. <laughs> and um, this is a really interesting story. This is a guy and his dad. So he was about my age, mid-50s, and uh, not that I'm mid-50s now, but back then. And his father was in his 80s. And they had traveled to the, you know, backward, backwater France to find where the dad's dad and the dad's uncle had fought in World War I. The dad's uncle had died. And of course, the dad's dad got back to Canada, hence he had a family sort of thing. We were staying a kilometer from Bomohamel. I'm sure you're familiar with that. The, the catastrophic first day of the Somme, 1916, July 1st, whereby over 800 members of the Newfoundland Regiment uh, went uh, to attack the German lines, and 68 reported for roll call the next morning. Uh, incredibly um, somber sight. But they wanted to find out where the uncle died. So being two good Newfoundlanders, uh, they crossed the channel, they didn't have a car, and they didn't speak a lick of French. So the dad, and, and, I, and I can't do a Newfoundland accent, I really apologize here, but the dad kept going up to people and said, bye, where's Monchi de Prix? Excuse me? Monchi de Prix. And so my daughter and I, who both speak French, said, I think he means Monchi de Prix. So he said, look, we'll take you two guys, we had a rental car, we'll take you guys to where the uncle fought and died. And we found this small town in France where the uncle had fought. And in fact, Monchi le Preux is one of five sites where the Newfoundlanders have sent caribous to commemorate the, the contribution of the Newfoundland Regiment in World War I. And, and I'll, never, I'll never forget, they didn't find where the uncle died, but in every cemetery, well not every, in a lot of the cemeteries in northern France, the Newfoundlanders fought separately from the Canadians, because of course Newfoundland was not part of Canada. So the Newfoundlanders were, born, were buried with separate gravestones. And, and the son, who again was my age, they would find a Newfoundland gravestone, he would drape a Newfoundland flag over the gravestone, and he would talk to the gravestone. I will never forget that as long as I live. What's my point here? My daughter and I left France um, after this two-week trip, we got on the plane, came back to Canada, and when we landed in, at Pearson, my daughter, being a typical 25-year-old, you know, turns on her phone to see what text she's missed from her friends, and she says, oh my God. I said, what do you mean, oh my God? There was a massive terrorist attack in Paris today. We left Paris the same day as the catastrophic Bataclan Theater and Stade de France attacks that killed 131 people. So it was an interesting juxtaposition for me. I had just retired from CSIS in April of 2015, and uh, as Dan said, I've, I've kind of kept involved in this in my sort of post-retirement career. I have a, a personal interest, especially in World War I and where the Canadians fought and died, and we had a terrorist attack take place the very day that we left the country. So, so what, what's the juxtaposition here is that terrorism superseded once again an otherwise very normal trip to the north of France. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Now normally this is not fair. I'm being asked to give the presentation, not ask you the questions. But I'm going to ask you a simple question. Well, I think it's a simple question. We'll see if it's as simple as I think it is. By the way, I love the fact, this is the first time in 38 years I've had a beer before I give my presentation. I gotta do this a lot more often. I gotta come to RCMI more often, obviously. Okay, this is a skill testing question. Since Confederation, how many Canadians, or rather how many people, have died in Canada from a terrorist attack? 152 years and counting? In 152 years. So I can see, I see people putting their thinking cap. I, I can see light bulbs going on. Is it bigger than a bread box? Any, 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 any ballpark, Pat, you can't answer. Any, any ballpark answers on how many Canadians have died in, and I, I'm, I'm using terrorism defined broadly, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. 
But, I, well, it's not as broad as you think it might be. How many think it is over a thousand Canadians have died in the past? Okay, nobody, everyone's shaking their head now. Over 500. A couple people nodding yes. More than a hundred. Eric saying yes. More than 50. The actual answer is 21. And I'm using a very, very broad definition of terrorism. If I were to narrow it even more, the answer is three. Now, what do I mean by 21? Actually, um, this country was a little less than a year old when we had our first successful terrorist attack in Ottawa in April of 1868. Thomas Darcy McGee was assassinated by a man called Patrick Whalen, who was believed to be a Fenian which was an Irish terrorist group in the 1850s, 1860s, largely US-based, trying to put pressure on Britain to leave the Irish alone. In fact, Patrick Whalen may, may not have been the actual uh, assassin. Uh, he was hanged a little more than a year later. A lot of conspiracy theories about that one. That's 1868. You have to go more than a century until the next death from terrorism. The October crisis in Quebec in 1970, Pierre Laporte. Right. Anyhow, I, I don't want to sort of draw out all of them, but if you count them up, and I'm throwing in what happened in Quebec City in January of 2017 with Alexandre Bissonnette in the mosque. He was not charged with terrorism under the criminal code. He pled guilty to first degree murder. So, so technically that's not terrorism from a legal perspective. I'm also not counting Alec Manassian. I, have, I, I would love to talk about Alec Manassian for days. But, but if I throw Manassian and Bissonnette and the two deaths in 2014 with two days apart, one outside of Montreal, one in Ottawa, and you throw in the Turkish military attaché killed, uh, actually when I was leaving Ottawa as a temp in 1982, that, that grand total is 21. If you remove Manassian, you remove Bissonnette, the grand total is four. Does your India feature in your... Uh... It does not because it wasn't in Canada. No, I'm, 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 I'm doing it purposely, but I will get to that. You're absolutely right. I'm talking about deaths in Canada on Canadian soil, Canadian airspace from terrorists. But you're absolutely right, sir. Air India, in fact, was the single largest act of terrorism in history prior to 9-11, and it was planned and perpetrated from Vancouver. So it's an act of terrorism. It's not an act of terrorism in Canada. I, I know I'm sort of... I, I'm, you know, splitting hairs here, but my point is, you know, the, the, the whole point of me being up here today is to talk about how big a threat is terrorism to Canada and how worried should we be. So if you take, let's take 21 as the figure, just for argument's sake. 21 people have died in 152 years in this country, in Canada. Do the math, that's not a lot of people, right? 21 deaths in 152 years, 21 deaths is a good morning in Afghanistan. I'm not being facetious. The Afghans have very courageously gone to the, the, the polls the last couple days to elect their president, and the Taliban, with whom President Trump is negotiating a peace treaty, I think that's against the Constitution somewhere in the States, I think they're still a listed entity under the State Department, have, have promised to disrupt the elections and no matter what happens in Afghanistan, the Taliban have promised to keep attacking the government and killing civilians until they come up with an Islamic emirate, which is what they've wanted since the departure of the Soviets and their formation in the early 90s. But the reason why I, I brought the Paris attacks into this was not just to make the juxtaposition, but even when compared to France as a nation, the numbers of deaths from terrorist attacks in France is at least an order of magnitude big, bigger than the deaths from terrorism in Canada. Let me give you another statistic. So, um, Dan joked about the fact that I work for CSIS, I can't tell anything. Gord will shut me up in a second, I'm sure. Um, this is public information at any, any given time. CSIS is, has several hundred investigations on the go. That's public information from a former director. Most of them are counterterrorism, some are counterintelligence, but in the post 9 11 era, it's been all counterterrorism all the time, which we actually was a mistake on our part.
to take resources away from other investigations because we had to. Because of the enormity of 9-11 and the initial fears, which some people still repeat, that the hijackers came through Canada, we, were, we had no, we, no choice but to divert investigative resources from every other investigation into counterterrorism on September the 12th, 2001. And that's pretty well been the, the, the story for the past 18 years. Although it's starting to change from what I understand from my, my former contacts at CSIS. Okay, so a couple hundred investigations at any one time. Here's a number for you. MI5, which is the British Security Service, pretty close to the CSIS equivalent in the United Kingdom, has admitted publicly to have 23,000 people on their list. Jihadis, Islamist extremists, 23,000 people that they're worried about. And I don't have to tell you how many attacks have taken place in the UK over the past 10 years. 7-7, seven, seven, we had the attacks in Manchester, we had the attacks on, on Westminster Bridge, we had the partial beheading of Lee Rigby, it goes on and on and on and on. The French Security Service has publicly identified 18,000 people of interest. The Belgian Security Service has publicly avowed 12,000 people of interest. <coughs> Now, I'm not equating people of interest with people running on the street with a suicide bomb. The point is, is that when you work for the security service, you have no choice but to keep an eye on as many people as you, as you physically can. And the head of MI5 has admitted publicly that his service has the resources to look at 5,000. Which means 18,000 people are going unwatched. Hence, you have a greater number of successful terrorist attacks in the UK because they simply don't have the numbers of men and women to do surveillance and recruit human sources and get, in, uh, get court warrants and those kinds of things. The reason why I want to raise this is I want you to have a perspective of the relative threat to Canada in 2019 in, with, when compared to the other countries that are our closest allies. Even south of the border, the Americans have a much larger problem than we do. That's just what we call the Islamist extremist threat, which is my particular specialty. It's what I've done for the past 20 years of my life. I've written four books on it. I'll share with you some of the titles in a bit. I'm not counting the, white, the far right white supremacist neo-Nazis, which in the States are probably about a dime a dozen right now. The FBI is now increasingly investigating that threat and the problem when you work in, in, in security intelligence or law enforcement is that you just don't move resources willy-nilly. When you move resources from A to B, A suffers. You've heard the, you heard the old phrase, robbing Peter to pay Paul? That's what security services and law enforcement do. You don't have the luxury of being wrong. You're only as good as your last failure. Anybody who's worked in, in law enforcement or security intelligence, the public doesn't care how many times you get it right. They just care when you, when you get it wrong. And when you miss something, where was your surveillance team? Why did Michael Zahaf Bebo get taken off your list in 2014? He's the guy that killed Corporal Nathan Cirillo in Ottawa and then rushed the center block of parliament. Why wasn't he stopped? Why was Aaron Driver a bit of a B-list terrorist, so I can use that term. Why was he able, under a peace bond, to build a bomb in his sister's house in Strathroy, Ontario, just north of where I'm from, London? It was, a, it was a lousy bomb. It didn't hurt anybody. But the fact is, he made a martyrdom video, and he was able to build a bomb. Had he had, you know, had, he had two neurons to rub together, he would have built a better bomb. And would have done a lot more damage. So, rather than being seen as a success story, it's seen as a failure. Because it, it was the FBI that called him out, he said, oh, by the way, we, we, he see this video, he sounds Canadian to us, he says A a lot. <laughs> right? yeah. But he was on a peace bond. Where was the coverage on the peace bond? What does a peace bond mean? Where, why wasn't he reporting to police on a regular basis? So th that's the world that, that you live in when you work in this business. But the bottom line is, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that the candidates should not be addressing national security and public safety issues in this election, I think there's many reasons why the Liberals are not, and, and one of them is called Omar Khadr. I mean, we won't go down that pathway. 
Um, the fact remains is that from a national security slash public safety perspective, the threat in Canada is relatively low. It is relatively manageable. So if you go to the, in, in the um, what do they call it, the um, Integrated Threat Assessment Center, or sorry, Integrated Terrorism Assessment Center, ITAC, which is housed within CSIS, it sets the level, the threat level for Canada. It's been at medium since 2014. Right after the attacks in Saint-Jean, outside of Montreal, and in Ottawa, two days apart, it got stuck at medium, it hasn't moved up, the barometer hasn't moved since 2014. And we've had a number of very minor things happen since then. We had a, a woman who, who tried to join Islamic State. Uh, she got turned back in Turkey. She went to a Canadian tire, picked up a golf club, and tried to, you know, you know tee off on someone's head. Uh, she was found guilty. She's serving a sentence right now. We had a guy up in Markham. Similarly, he wanted to go join Islamic State. He was found not guilty by reason of uh, mental incompetence. We had a guy uh, two years ago at Edmonton. Actually, two years ago... Today, 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 two years ago, two days ago, outside Commonwealth Stadium, ran down a police officer and tried to stab him. And then got back, got in his car, switched cars, went on Jasper Ave in Edmonton and, and struck four people. He had an Islamic State flag in his car. That was a successful attack, but thankfully no one died in that particular attack. So it's not that the instance of terrorism is zero. It's just that, relatively speaking, it's not that high. You've heard a lot about, about foreign fighters these days. How many have heard of Jihadi Jack? And what should we do with Jihadi Jack? Well, I can tell you, my Twitter feed and my comment section of my blog, I haven't seen one person yet say, let's bring him home and, and you know, give him a condo on, on, on the Danforth, right? A lot of Canadians are very, very upset about these guys because they left the country. In one case, a very famous case of a young man called Ferris Sheridan out in Calgary, posted in a video for Islamic State in which he burned his Canadian passport and said, I'm coming for you. So not a lot of love lost between most Canadians and these so-called foreign fighters. Big debate now, do we repatriate them? I had an op-ed piece in the Globe last week on this. Surprisingly, I said no. We shouldn't repatriate them for all kinds of legal reasons. But what's, what's the threat from these guys? Again, public figures that CSIS has released, the former director, Michel Coulomb, said approximately 60 Canadians have come back from fighting in Iraq and Syria and probably other conflicts like Somalia with Al-Shabaab over the past couple of years. 60 people. Where are they? We're not sure. Are, we, are they being monitored? Probably. Maybe. Do they pose a threat? Potentially. Again, let me give you some comparative figures. I was in Tunisia two years ago giving a lecture and I talked to a Tunisian guy and Tunisia was one of the most, one of the largest contributors to terrorism in Islamic, so, so the Islamic State, the terrorist group Islamic State, attracted 40,000 foreign fighters. 40,000 people from over 100 countries. The country, the, the, the largest contributor per capita was Trinidad and Tobago, which is really interesting, okay? I, I could talk about Trinidad for a very long time. We have, there's ties between Trinidad and Canada in terms of terrorism many, many, many years ago. But when I was in Tunisia, I, I talked to the Tunisian official, and, he, and Tunisia is believed to have sent between three and 6,000 people to fight for Islamic State. Most are dead. I, I, I excuse the crassness. A dead terrorist is a good terrorist. One less guy to follow. He also shared with me that Tunisian authorities prevented 21,000 from leaving. 21,000 Tunisians wanted to leave their country to join Islamic State. You think, well, who cares, right? Michael Zahaf Bibo was a frustrated foreign fighter. He wanted to go to Libya. Martin Couture-Rouleau was a frustrated foreign fighter. He wanted to go join Islamic State. Rahab Dugmash, the woman with the, with the, with the five iron, and the Canadian Tire was a frustrated foreign fighter. She only got as far as Turkey until she was turned back. The, the threat here is that those that, that go and come back could in fact be trained and radicalized further. Those that don't go because their passports were seized, which was the case of Martin Couture-Rouleau in Montreal, or, or, or for whatever reason, 
they, they don't succeed in their plans, might say, basically, I can't do it there, I might as well do it here. And we've had three instances of frustrated foreign fighters have planned attacks in Canada, two of which were successful in the fall of 2014. But still, this doesn't change the point I'm trying to make here, is that relatively speaking, and this comes from a guy that worked in security intelligence for 32 years, and I've written five books on terrorism. I, if, if terrorism stops, I'm out of a job and I have to really retire, and I'm not looking forward to that day. So terrorism is not going away, but I think as Canadians, you really have to be honest and deal with the figures that we know. And for all kinds of reasons, most of which I have no idea the answers to, we don't have the levels of terrorism here in Canada that other countries do. Now, is that going to change? Possibly. And someone asked me earlier on if I would touch on the white supremacist, neo-Nazi, far-right kind of phenomenon. I'll, I'll just talk, talk about it briefly. Uh, I'm not a specialist in that particular brand of terrorism, and I'm a huge believer in not speaking about things on which I know nothing or very little. Some of my ex-colleagues don't follow that uh, advice, much to my chagrin. I think it is a threat, and certainly uh, Bissonnette will be an example of a far-right inspired individual. Manassian, I'm not sure what you make of him. I, I, I think he's lying, by the way, about his connection to the incels. That's my personal opinion. Like he made it up on the day he, he did his attack. But we, we see groups like Soldiers of Odin in Edmonton. What is it with, with Norse mythology in the far right? These guys should watch more Marvel or DC or something and, and get, you know, get their frustrations out kind of thing. You know, maybe watch Thor, Hammer of Thor, four or five times or Game of Thrones or something and they can sort of you know, get their jollies that way. We have the groups called the Three Percenters out, out west. This is, this is, I love Three Percenters. Where does the name come from? It comes from this notion that 3% of Americans rose up against the British in 1776. And these guys are the descendant of those 3%ers, and they were in Edmonton. <laughs> we, I, I, history is not my strong point. I don't think we overthrow the British yoke in a, in a war like our American cousins did. But there's a 3 percenters chapter in Edmonton. And there's, a couple, there's other neo-Nazi groups that have enlisted, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, is that yes, the far right is a threat in this country. There are groups that espouse anti-immigration, that's violent, uh, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, the list goes on and on and on. But I still don't see a critical mass in our country than what, we, what we're seeing, certainly in the United States. I know the FBI is very, very worried about what do we do with these guys? And then of course in the States, you've got First Amendment freedom of speech. Uh, the things we can do here in Canada, the Americans couldn't touch if they tried. It's, it's protected speech. We don't have the same constitution the Americans do. We can investigate things to a much greater level than the Americans can because we don't, we don't set aside all this hateful speech that the Americans say is protected by constitutional guarantees. So I do think it's a problem, it's, but it's a bigger problem in Germany. The BFV, which is the German equivalent of CSIS, the Domestic Security Service has identified 27,000 neo-Nazis that they're worried about. I'm sure the Brits have thousands as well. So you can see, again, I mean, the one thing I've tried to rely upon in my career is you've got to have data to support your argumentation. A lot of things are written and theorizing about X, Y, or Z, and it's, you know, there's no data. I think terrorism is a threat because... Well, where's your data? Come up with actual facts. And if you look at the numbers, to me, the only, the only reasonable, rational conclusion you can draw is that as of 2019 in Canada, it's not that bad. And I think this is important because we are living in a post-9-11 world. We are living in a world which has been terrorism, 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 terrorism. And the truth is, is that outside of our peaceable kingdoms, that's what they call Canada, the peaceable kingdom, outside of our, our lovely realm, terrorism is a big, big problem. So uh, I do a lot of, I, I, I'm on, on Twitter a lot and all the social media talk about terrorism. There isn't a day goes by when I'm not issuing 15 to 20 tweets about a terrorist attack somewhere in the world every single day. And in places like Iraq and Somalia, it's, it's daily. In Nigeria, it's weekly. In Pakistan, it's weekly. In Afghanistan, it's hourly. 
So I think it's important to realize that the threat from terrorism is real. Absolutely. But you have to get a handle on the relative size to it when you, when you look at how do you create policy? What do your priorities have to be as a government? And I think this is why, and, and, and you know, maybe some of you will disagree, I think this is why the, the parties, the leaders, have not addressed this much in the campaign. The Liberals, because they'll be embarrassed by it. <laughs> and no one else just seems to raise this as a significant issue. And, and to be perfectly honest, you know, what's, the, what's the greatest single cause outside of disease of death in Canada? It's not terrorism. It's opioids. Right? How many Canadians have died from fentanyl overdoses? How many tens of thousands of people have died? That is a national crisis. That's something you need to deal with. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't look at terrorism uh, as a problem, but I'm going to, to, to end my talk with some suggestions that I, I put, and if you, if you, shameless self-promotion number one. This was my latest book, came out a year ago. It's called An End to the War on Terrorism. And it's, it, the title is deliberate. I think the term war on terrorism is one of the most foolish. Wow, that is a great intro to talking about the war on terrorism. <laughs> I'm going to have to use that at some point in the future. A, a, a man much wiser than I, uh, way back in 2002, wrote something very profound. He says, if you're going to declare a war, don't declare it against a common noun. <laughs> common nouns don't surrender. It, declare it against penguins or Germany or, sorry, I shouldn't use that. that we did it twice already. Um, you know, proper nouns can surrender and promise not to do it again. Common nouns cannot. So think of the war on drugs. Think of the war on poverty. Think of the war on anything. Are we anywhere near the end? Of course we're not. The war on terrorism, unfortunately, is a war on a common noun. So what I argue is that there is a role for the military, including the Canadian military, to combat terrorism. It has to be very, very, very specific and very targeted. Instead, what we've done, or rather what the Americans have done since 9-11, is do what? Well, they've invaded two countries. Invading countries doesn't end well most of the time. So they invaded Afghanistan in 2001, they invaded Iraq in 2003, they, they egged on the Ethiopians to invade Somalia in 2006, which led to the creation of Al-Shabaab as a terrorist group, which did not exist before 2006. And the, the invasion of Iraq in 2003 led directly to the creation of Islamic State, which was an old Al-Qaeda and Iraq affiliate way back in the early 2000s. So the role, as far as I'm concerned, the role for the military is very, very um, circumspect. It should be, I love special ops operations. The bin, Laden, the bin Laden operation, absolutely go for it. Find them, kill them, get out. No one's going to mourn Bin Laden's death, right? Airstrikes, drone strikes, highly problematic. The Pentagon has uh, lied about the numbers of civilian casualties due to drone and airstrikes by the U.S. Air Force. And we know for a fact that airstrikes that go awry simply create the conditions under which the next generation of terrorists are born. The history is replete with examples whereby civilians die, the survivors vow revenge. So airstrikes and drone strikes are better than invading, but only marginally better than invading. So it's special forces is the way to go about that. Not surprisingly, I think that in, when you talk about deterrence of, of, of you know, terrorism, counterterrorism, the number one actor that has to get the lion's share of the work in Canada, United States, I don't care where, are your security intelligence and law enforcement agencies. Those are the ones you pay to identify, investigate, and, and in terms of law enforcement, arrest and charge individuals plotting acts of terrorism. That's where you put your resources. Counterterrorism is a security intelligence slash law enforcement function. It is not a military function for the most part. Now, some would also argue that we need to do a lot more on the sort of softer end of things. There's an acronym you may have come across the last couple of years called CVE, Countering Violent Extremism. 
It's gone through several iterations in my time. Basically, it's the notion that if you do things like, you know, uh, play basketball and, and establish youth clubs and, and, and finger painting or something, you're going to prevent the next generation of terrorists from being formed. I, I, have, I have a healthy skepticism for CVE. I, I don't, I, I completely agree on community policing insofar as whatever that is. But the one thing we learned, well, actually, we haven't learned it. The one thing those of us in security intelligence learned a long time ago was that there's no such thing as a terrorist profile. It's not about poverty, it's not about lack of education, it's not about mental health, it's not about, you know, I didn't get what I wanted in life. There's a theory out there, um, what is it, um, I, I, I'm drawing a blank now, it is a, an academic that has this theory about you know, not achieving what you wanted in life. Well, hands up everybody here who 100% achieved everything you wanted when you were three years old. I'm not seeing a lot of hands up right now. You're all potential terrorists. I'm, I'm, I'm joking, of course, but the point is, and the cases we looked at here in Canada, shameless self-promotion number two, there's no such thing as a profile. It does not exist. There's as many examples of kindergarten dropouts and PhDs that have planned acts of terrorism in Canada. And all the, all the data is in here, by the way. It's all open source data. So we have to be really very judicious when we see this as the solution to the problem. Of course you want to stop terrorism from happening before it even gets its you know, toehold onto that pathway. But where do you start? When potentially, and I stress potentially, every single one of us in this room, given the right circumstances, could express support for a terrorist movement. You want a case in point? Moi, 14 years old, a couple years ago. I was 14 years old. I was in a Catholic high school, one in Ontario. And I was being taught by a nun, this is being a Catholic high school, of course. And she taught us about a man called Cesar Chavez. Does that bring back any memories of anybody in the room? He, of course, tried to organize farm workers, migrant farm workers in Southern California in the 1970s who were being treated abysmally, paid nothing, exposed to pesticides. They were living in hovels, picking grapes all day, and Chavez wanted to organize them. I got really angry. This was a social, she was a social justice nun, I was a social justice advocate. Had I been able to find California on a map when I was 14 years old, I would have gone on the next Greyhound bus and fought for Cesar Chavez and taken out those farmers that were exploiting these poor workers. 14 year old, I'm old, old kid from London, Ontario. You laugh, right? In 2007, four young men from a high school down the street from my, where, I grew, where I went to, radicalized in high school and left to join Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, two of whom died in a terrorist attack in Algeria in 2011, in which 41 people were killed. They were, well, they weren't my contemporaries because I'm old, but they went to a high school that I used to play football against, London, Ontario. So it can ha the, the, the bottom line is it can happen anywhere. So how do, you, how do you prevent that? How many basketball leagues do you create? How many soccer games do you have? How many times do you have cops playing hopscotch with kids to prevent radicalization of violence? I'm not saying that you don't do anything. I'm not, I'm not going down that, that road. What worries me, though, is that this is now seen as a panacea. And the Canadian government, Public Safety Canada, where I spent 18 months, very long months, I'll never forget, has promised $35 million over five years for CVE programming. What happens when the government announces it has money? Pick me, pick me, I have a program. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to um, undermine or criticize the intent behind the programs. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about, is, do the programs have anything there? Is there any kind of statistical longitudinal data that shows that they actually work? And I think the answer to that is no. One thing that CVE suffers from around the world, and scholars will acknowledge this, no one has shown how it works or if it works. There's no effectiveness measurement. There's no assessment. How do you know that someone, you stop somebody from being a terrorist? I mean, let me tell you, I like telling you another story. How long are we for time, by the way? Am I getting to the end now? 
We're good. Okay. So a couple years ago, here in, in the CSIS office in Toronto region, uh, a young man came to our attention because of his online activities. I won't say how we got onto that because that would be uh, that would be illegal for me to say that, and then, then I'd have to kill you all at eight o'clock tonight. But bottom line is, we got onto this kid, and uh, so we said, okay, it's interesting. This is not good. So we hauled him in for a talk, and then we brought in, I think, local law enforcement. We brought in uh, probably a parent. We brought in a religious figure to talk to this kid. Son, this is not a good pathway. If you continue down this pathway, it's not going to end well for you. And basically, we put the fear of God into him. Right? So he confessed, and he said, you know, I, I, I get it. I've seen the light. I'm going to stop it. Case closed. Let's move on. Six years later, same young man, six years older, shows up in BC, doing what? Visiting the same sites he did six years previously. In other words, all this wonderful effort, all this, this intensive attempt to try to get this kid to abandon this incipient ideology was all for naught. I have no idea where he is now. I don't know if he's been cured, whatever that means. Maybe he's on a plane there. But I have no idea. I, I, I simply don't. But my point is here is that there simply is, and a lot of people are, are, are really putting a lot of brain cells behind this right now around the world. How do we determine that what we're doing is actually effective? Because we don't know right now. Allowing in a touch de-radicalization, which I'm a huge skeptic on, by the way. I don't know, I mean, unless you've got, uh, who was that Johnny Carson character? Um, Karnak the uh, Magnificent? Yeah, unless Karnak's in the crowd who can read minds, uh, I don't know what's going on in your head right now, especially yours right now, Brad. I don't, want to know. I don't want to know. You know, these de-radicalization programs say, oh yeah, we've eradicated the, the, the bad thoughts. I'm, I'm thinking Dumbledore with the Pensieve, you know, with the uh, little cloud there. That's two Harry Potter references in the same talk. That's pretty good, eh? I, I don't know. I, I've been to Saudi Arabia. I've had the Saudis tell me they've got an 89% success rate, whatever the hell that's supposed to mean. I also know that if you go through the Saudi DRAD program, you get a, a wife, a car, and a job. <laughs> Pick me. Well, I've already got a wife. But anyway, I'll, I'll take the car and the job, right? So I, I, I'm, I'm being sort, slightly dismissive here, but the point is, is that a lot of people are making some very, very bold claims about what is possible and not possible in this whole realm. And I think that governments are not well placed to judge what are the ones to do and the ones not to do. So when you're talking about deterrence of terrorism, it is a spectrum. It starts with how do you prevent it from starting in the first place? How do you prevent radicalization to violence? I don't know that you can. And I was reading a fascinating article just uh, this afternoon when I was just resting from my very... Um, arduous train trip in a business class from Ottawa. And uh, it was about gu gun control in the States. And you know, they're saying, well, maybe the public health model is good for gun control. And the public health model talks about what do you see, and it's like, uh, help me, Peter, something in protective factors. What's the, what's the first one? And whatever it engenders it. There's it, a number of models. Yeah. Right there. But one thing is protective factors. What are the protective factors that prevent you from getting a cold or, you know, an STD, we all know what those protective factors are. But there are no protective factors for radicalization. There are none. Because anyone under the right circumstance, including 14-year-old grade 10 students at Catholic Central High School in London, Ontario, in 1974, oh my God, am I that old? Was susceptible to radicalizing because of a nun. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting taking nuns out of the school, although I don't think there's any left anyway. But my point is, is that this is a really, this is like nailing jello to the wall, trying to figure out who your next terrorist is going to be. This is not predictive. And there's a lot of models, there's a threat assessment models out there, there's all kinds of models. Uh, Strat4, I just saw today, claimed that it had 18 out of 19 predictions right last year on Islamic State. I'd love to see those predictions and what they were based on. <coughs> so this is really hard stuff. It's really hard stuff. But we have to keep in, in mind, at the forefront of our minds, the relative nature and the relative scale of the threat. And as of October the 1st, 2019, in Canada, the threat is relatively low. And I don't think it's going to get relatively high 
anytime soon. At least I certainly hope not. So I think as a, as a, as a population, as, as, as an electorate, as people that discuss these issues, whether it's on a daily basis like I do, or periodically, or never as the leaders don't seem to be doing right now, it's really important to step back and say, what are the facts telling me? Now yes, there's all kinds of things CSIS does that I'm gonna talk about publicly, and the, and the RCMP insets, the integrated national, uh, national security enforcement teams don't avow publicly, so no, we don't get the full picture, but we're not Afghanistan, and we're not Somalia, and we're not Nigeria, and we're not Iraq, and we're not Egypt, and we're not the United States, and we're not France, we're not the UK, we're not Belgium, and the list goes on and on and on and on. So that is, that is my conclusion. As Canadians, we should, some, we should celebrate whatever the hell it is we're doing, which we're not quite sure what it is we're doing, but we're doing it right. So keep doing what you don't know what you're doing, because it's working. And I think I'll end with that. Uh, we have some time for some questions, but uh, the rule of the game is, please, if you'd be kind enough, you have a question to go up to the microphone so that we can record your question. And so you'll be heard over the HVAC roar. That's right. Who has a question? Stun silence. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> surprise. <laughs> Only so that the opportunity doesn't go wasted. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in your comment that you think that this... Uh, issue has to be dealt with in terms of law enforcement domestically and putting things before the courts and charges of those who uh, warrant obviously being charged. Do you think that the legal regime in Canada, the question of whether or not terrorism per se deserves a special yeah. definition under the code as opposed to other forms of criminal activity that were on the right track, that previous governments have pursued the right course, and I'm just curious on your thoughts on that point. I swear this is not a planted question, but I, I, it, it's a really good one because I think the answer is absolutely not. I think our courts are woefully inadequate and woefully ignorant when it comes to terrorism. You want some data? Again, yeah, numbers, right? Toronto 18, court case I worked on a lot, 2005, 2006. Uh, June 2nd of 2006, 18 men were arrested. Actually 17, because one was arrested in August. They were gonna explode three tons of ammonium nitrate in downtown Toronto. 18 went to trial, uh, seven had charges stayed, and four of the 11 found guilty, were, or five were given time served, and the rest went to jail, and only two people to this day are still in jail, the two, two of the ringleaders are still in prison. Uh, Victoria, the pressure cooker bomb plot of 2013, I actually testified for the Crown. They were found guilty by jury on appeal. The judge threw it out saying that they were duped by the RCMP and upon appeal, the appeal, it was, it was upheld. They are free people. They wanted to explode three pressure cooker bombs on Canada Day in the afternoon on the lawn of the BC legislature in Victoria. They would have killed or maimed hundreds. Via passenger, Shehebe Sagai or Raj Jazer found guilty by jury in 2015 of plotting to uh, derail a via passenger plane in the Niagara to St. Catharines corridor, found guilty by jury. The jury verdict has been thrown out as of three weeks ago because the jury was not selected properly. Two young men, two young uh, teenagers in Montreal, well not young teenagers, uh, tried to join Islamic State in 2017. They were both uh, um, found innocent. They were acquitted of all charges. So in answer to your question, I think we are abysmal. I don't think the courts get it. I could also regale you for days about the so-called national security certificates, which I used to work on a lot at CSIS. These are people who were not Canadian citizens we were trying to get rid of, and they're here 25 years later because the courts can't get rid of them. Part of this has to do with evidence versus intelligence. It's very, very complicated, but I know that one of them that actually was allowed to stay has become a Canadian citizen, and I know for a fact he's radicalizing people in the city where he lives. So I think that, that, that that's a very long answer to a very short question. I don't think judges get it. I don't think courts get it. Juries seem to get it, but judges don't. Um, and and you know the, the, the payouts as well. The, the, we paid out fifty-two million dollars so far to people who were apparently uh, treated badly by other nations, and we paid out damages. No, I'm not. I'm not a big fan right now. And I would I would argue that in fact courts need 
an incredible amount of training just to understand. I'll just, I'll just give a very small anecdote. So when Shehab Esagayar, this is the Via Passenger plot in 2013, when he took it, he took the, he defended himself in court, which usually ends badly when I've seen all these crime dramas, right? Never defend yourself in court. Um, the court and a lot of the people thought he was mentally unstable. In actual fact, everything he said in court was 100% consistent with Islamist extremist ideology. He wasn't crazy, he was actually a jihadi. And he was sharing with the court his very deeply held views on the state of the world and what he thinks it should be. But he was dismissed, he dismissed as schizophrenic. So, sorry, did that come across strong enough? Yes, sir, thank you. A very, very interesting, informative, and thought-provoking speech. But towards the last part of your speech, you spoke about a number of countries that we are not, mm -hmm. right? You talked about Somalia, mm -hmm. you talked about Afghanistan, you talked about, although you didn't mention it, there are many other countries where terrorism is obvious and almost uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. Now, I would hate to mention this point, but I think it might be germane. Our immigration policy mm -hmm is almost virtually wide open, isn't it? Are we then, let me put it this way, inheriting uh, people from some of those countries that may form the terrorist cells in this country of the future? Uh, that's, that's, that's a very good question, sir, and I, I, would, I would simply respond to you that um, there's never a 100% guarantee, but I know, having worked for CSIS, one of CSIS's responsibility is security screening, and that security screening is for immigrants. Anybody who applies to become a Canadian citizen, correct me if I'm wrong here, my former CSIS guys, anyone who applies for Canadian citizenship is vetted by CSIS. If there's any information that suggests they pose a threat to national security, the citizenship is not granted. Um, certain countries, the ones you mentioned, they are vetted at the front end um, by CSIS officers or, or, or Canadian Border Services or, or CIC, Immigration Canada. I think they do a very credible job, and I think that they stop a lot of people that wouldn't get here anyway. But, as I mentioned towards the end of my answer, the last gentleman's question is with those that got here and we tried to remove them, we couldn't. And that's, that's the fault of the government. The government had all the information necessary to remove people who did not have an inherent right to be here. They were not Canadian citizens. And it was quite clear, given that the intelligence that had been gathered that they posed a threat to national security, the government caved. Uh, and that's unconscionable as far as I'm concerned. Um, no, I, I do think immigration, I think we do the best job we can. Uh, the only 100% the only guarantee is to have no immigration from anywhere, because it doesn't be Somali, it could be uh, someone from the UK, it could be somebody from Australia. But I, I think that given that what I know, the way that I understand the system works, I would say it works as well as it could if you want to be a country that encourages immigration. And I happen to be a as a third generation Eastern European immigrant, I happen to be in favor of it. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.